from the entertainment capital of the world, Las Vegas. I am your host, Christopher Calloway, for Creator Talks, the interview show for comic book aficionados. On this day, President's Day, I am joined by actor, playwright, and now writing his first graphic novel, Lawrence Luckinbill. Lawrence is known for his one-man plays that he starred in, Teddy Now, The Life of Teddy Roosevelt. Also, he has portrayed Clarence Darrow, Ernest Hemingway, and President Lyndon Baines Johnson. Teddy is based upon Lawrence's one-man play, Teddy Now, and it is illustrated by Eric Tate, and I have read the book, and I will tell you, Eric was a great choice to illustrate this book. It is outstanding. It is published by Dead Reckoning, which is the publishing imprint of the Naval Institute Press, located in Annapolis, Maryland a city that I love and have been to many times over the past several decades and was where me and Mrs. Creator Talks went for our honeymoon. So in addition to talking about the graphic novel Teddy, Lawrence and I discuss how he was picked to play the part of Cybok, the half-brother of Spock, in the motion picture Star Trek V. Larry tells me about the discussion he had with the director of the film, William Shatner, and how Larry insisted the role be portrayed by him. The characters that Larry has portrayed in his one-man plays and even the character of Cybok in Star Trek are very important to him. They stand for things that he believes in. We are going to talk about that, and since we're just the day after Valentine's Day, how to keep a happy marriage. And so now it is my extreme pleasure and honor to present to you Lawrence Luckinbill. Here now on Creator Talks. Welcome to Creator Talks. Thank you. One of the reasons why I brought you here today, the upcoming graphic novel, Teddy, and this is being published through the Naval Institute Press and Dead Reckoning. You wrote and performed a one-man show about Teddy Roosevelt, Teddy Tonight. Your first one was what, back in 2002? Yeah, exactly. How many performances did you do of that? I did a whole string of them in New York, off-Broadway, for the first run. Then uh, I took it out on the road and played to regional theaters and on cruise ships and all kinds of places that you wouldn't expect anybody to be interested in Teddy Roosevelt. But uh, he is a fascinating subject for people once they get to hear anything about him. The genesis of these one-man shows is a good story. David Susskind called me out of the blue and told me I'd be playing Lyndon Johnson. And uh, it was Christmas, and I was unemployed, and I was worrying about my children (laughs) when he called. But I turned him down. The reason was I just was afraid, because this was a television show for PBS. I looked at the script. It was very long, and it was just me. I thought, I can't do that. But uh, my dear wife, who's in the kitchen right now, she read a piece of this lengthy script, which was Lyndon talking. Just Lyndon. And she said, well, if you don't take this, I guess you really don't want to be an actor anymore. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And so it was a challenge. I zipped up my fly and uh, <laughs> said, okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Finally, I did it. My objections to it were that uh, I wasn't six feet four and I wasn't a Texas uh, politician. Besides that, I had been uh, a protester at the Pentagon and the Capitol in the 60s, and I, uh, I hated him. And Susskind just took a long pause, and he said, that will change, Larry. And so it did. As I began to read into this history of a president, and this was in 1987, a couple decades after he had died, and uh, it started me on this long path of writing about what I call great Americans. These are men who shaped the 20th century with their decisions and usually about social justice, although there were always wars and all of this stuff. So now I have four shows. I was diverted from Hollywood and even from Broadway for a while by starting out on this detour, this trek to the one-man show. I'm still doing it. So it's been an incredibly instructive ride for me and made me a better citizen. In fact, turned me into a citizen. Because like most of us, I thought it all just kind of worked by itself, Washington. 
but now we see that it certainly doesn't. So anyway, uh, yes, 2002, I don't know why I started on Teddy. Uh, I was interested in him. I do know what the actual uh, ignition point was. Harry Middleton, uh, who was the uh, man who ran the LBJ Library, Presidential Library in Austin, Texas, asked me to do Linden there, which I did several times. And then he called me out of the blue a few years later and said, uh, do you have anything on Teddy Roosevelt? And I knew that there was a play out there that James Whitmore had done called Bully. So I tried to find that at Dramatist Play Service, and uh, they didn't have it in print. They gave me the address of his widow, uh, Whitmore's widow. So I wrote to her, and she charged me $125 just to read it. So I thought, (laughs) well, that's interesting. And when I read it, it was, in a word, unplayable. And how Whitmore did it was his charm and down-to-earth Americanness and all of that. But it still was not a good play. It didn't have any reason to exist. The reason for a play to exist is that there's got to be a gigantic obstacle that the hero has got to overcome. That's where the interest lies, is how is how's he going to do this? He can't possibly do this. I told Harry Middleton, I, there are a couple of plays that don't work, Harry, but I could probably write my own. He said, do it. You're here on January. <laughs> it was September. <laughs> so anyway, that lasted quite a while, that sort of glow. And then I went to the library where I live in Westchester County in South Salem, New York. I checked out, as it turned out, about 35 or 36 books on Teddy. And the, the ladies who ran the library, I'm always grateful for because they let me keep these books for months and months and months and didn't charge me a penny of overage. <laughs> you know, so anyway, I started in on writing it, and it was first you read, and then you read between the lines, and then you read between the between the lines in order to find out what really went on in someone's life. History written by others is just their story. And so I had to pull my own story out of Teddy's life. And the story that I found was the fact that Teddy built for himself from childhood a warrior philosophy. And he was urged on by his father, who was afraid he would die of childhood asthma, uh, which he had severely. And he couldn't breathe, and his father would take him out in his carriage and drive through the streets of New York really, really fast so that he would be, wow, oh boy, you know, just when he was a little kid he would forget about his breathing problem. And gradually, he developed this philosophy that every man has got to have this personal power. He's got to exercise it for the good of others and himself. So that fascinated me. And then I realized that five months before Teddy died of congestive heart failure in 1919, his wife's favorite son, he had five children, And so did I, just by chance. And I thought, how do you have a favorite? But sometimes that happens. But Teddy had no favorites. But he also loved this boy who was 20 years old, and he was just like Teddy. The others were not. This boy inveigled his way into the American Air Force in World War I. He was too young. And he also wore glasses like his dad. You know, his eyes were not great. But he got into World War I as a fighter pilot. <laughs> of course, his mother and he were just terrified about all this. But anyway, there came a call five months away from his death that his son had been shot down in combat. And he didn't tell his wife at first. He couldn't. And then he had an obligation to fulfill to go and speak for his brother-in-law, who was running for Republican office in New York. And his sister called and said, you don't have to come under the circumstances. And he said to her, under the circumstances, it is my simple duty. And so he got on the train and he went from Oyster Bay, New York, to Saratoga, New York, where he was going to give the speech in a big field house. And he always had a big fat speech written with a lot of technological details about what's wrong and what's going on. And right at that point, 
the speech was really about what he thought Woodrow Wilson was doing wrong about World War I. And at some point during the speech, with this hanging over his head about his son, he departed from his script and he set it aside and he just talked from the heart. Those remarks were black boxed in every newspaper in the world the following day. And they were basically a plea for Americans and all people really to realize that when we send out these young men who believe in their country, we send them out to die these horrendous, ignominious deaths in the trenches or in the air, that we better damn sure make sure that when they come home, they come home to a nation they can be proud of. He never mentioned his son, but of course, the, the next day it came out that Quentin actually had indeed died and was already buried in France. This moment in Teddy's life was a, uh, you might call it a repudiation of the warrior philosophy because his son had died by attacking a squadron, a German squadron, alone. And he was flying at the back end of his own American squadron because they didn't trust him. They thought he would do just this thing. And he's the one who saw the wing flash in the clouds above. And before the squadron could relay information to go get these Germans, Teddy had already flown at full speed up to engage them in combat. And he was shot down in 30 seconds. This created a terrible sadness between himself and his wife. And when he died, he was choking to death from not being able to breathe, speaking of today's horror. And his wife was asleep in the master bedroom across the way. I've been to Sagamore Hill and Oyster Bay and seen these rooms and listened to the wonderful park rangers talk about it. They loved Teddy. And everything he did was just very manly, but it was also rash quite often. And he was a determined man. So this guy is so interesting to me. I continue to read about him. Every time I play the play now, it gets more moving to me entirely because just five months after his son was put in his grave on the border of Germany and France, he gave up the ghost and left. And his wife lived on at Sagamore Hill for the next 30 years. It's an American story, and it's a story about something these decisions that we do to save our own lives early in life, the kinds of positions we take, the fortresses we build around ourselves, sometimes have tragic consequences later in life if you don't adapt and mellow and change. And it gave me a great pause, too, because as an actor, I was always extremely aggressive in the sense of wanting to find the truth. And uh, I found out there's a better way. The better way is to accept all of life and go from there and see how you develop a philosophy of your own to live like a real human being. That's a long story. It's a very good story. And to hear you tell that story, I find it fascinating. And I look forward to the graphic novel that I've seen some of the art of where some of those events are depicted. You very graciously put your plays on your website. So I spent an evening where I watched the entire one man play. I just loved it. And I just am amazed at how you personified him and spoke with the audience and actually engaged the audience in participating to some degree in the performance. Yes, that's the thing that I learned with doing Lyndon was that Lyndon liked to make jokes. And uh, every joke he made was organized to make a point about the issue that he happened to be talking about. Why did Lyndon do that? Uh, politicians do that because they want to connect with their audience. They know that they have to connect with their audience. We see that today drastically in one case and more empathetically in another case. That's the job of an actor, too. You've got to connect with the audience. And if you can kibitz with them a little bit, it just relaxes people and they start to trust you right away. I've written four one-man plays with the help of these four men, of course, and everyone has that facet to it, which I learned to do in Linden. It's something you really can't do without as an actor is response from the audience. And that doesn't mean that people can uh, actually get up and talk to you. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you have to know where to cut the communication if there is some from the audience. Like I used to walk out as Linden and do a joke about how much 
better uh, the Democrats were than the Republicans. And I was in Texas, and I was facing a Republican <laughs> audience. <laughs> so I said, oh, there sounds like a bunch of Republicans out there. And some guy in the center, a young guy, said, reform Democrats. <laughs> <laughs> sounds like a bunch of Republicans out there. <laughs> <laughs> now that was quick. <laughs> Reform Republicans. <laughs> when I was a boy, uh, there was a public hanging over in Louisiana, and the deputy sheriff said to the poor condemned man, he said, uh, according to state law, you have five minutes in which to choose the words that you want to use as your last act. And the poor old fellow said, well, Mr. Sheriff, I, I just don't have anything to say, so why don't you go on and get it over with. And the fellow jumped up in the back of the audience, and he said, Mr. Sheriff, if he doesn't want those five minutes, I'd like to have him. I'm a candidate for Congress. <laughs> so you have to deal with that. <laughs> and just a little note about Teddy. I was on a ship in 2000 heading through the Panama Canal. And as soon as we got out into the Pacific, I had to do my show. But 15 minutes before, and we were hitting some Pacific rollers, I knew I was going to have to be uh, Captain Ahab up there. They came and told me that the whole front row were Panamanian diplomats and people from the government, because that was also the year that we gave back the Panama Canal to Panama. And, of course, Teddy uh, had a great regard for what he did with the Panama Canal, it would not have been built without him. His take on Panama and the Colombians was not too pleasant. He was very uh, like, get on the stick, you people, you know. And uh, so as I performed this to these Panamanian diplomats, there was not a single smile and a single sense of uh, connection. So I figured I had to get through that. And I did. They were fine afterwards. We shook hands and we talked a little bit. They were all very distinguished gentlemen. You know, American imperial politics was not for them. <laughs> I always wondered how you kept your performances fresh for you. And I can see now with the interaction, that certainly does it. And your continued research and reading about these figures like Teddy Roosevelt, LBJ. Have you ever had to adjust your performance, not just a given night, but after getting some feedback, say, you know, I think I'm going to do it differently this way going forward. Yes. How do you do that? Yeah. Do you have an example of something you had to do like that? That was one, uh, you know, the mm -hmm. realization that I had a Republican audience. I had to downpedal some of the things that Lyndon said often about the Republicans. I had a choice. Either I could go forward and hit them hard or I could soft pedal it. And I decided, since it was a Texas audience, to go even farther. <laughs> <laughs> but to do it with the sense of good cheer that Lyndon projected during these kinds of speeches. And he was always talking about something important like Medicare or whatever. Because it was a younger audience too, I thought these folks will take it and they won't get soured by it. So you have to make a decision on the, that you don't even know you're making as you perform because you're busy when you're performing a one man show. When I first, went out on stage with Lyndon in the very beginning of this uh, in 1988. I kept feeling lonely and wishing somebody would talk back to me. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, no, it's you, buddy. You just got to keep going. But eventually I go into a town that I'd not been in and to do Lyndon. On the way in, I would always ask the uh, limo driver or the whoever the transportation was, well, they were local, and if they were, I'd say, what's going on in town? What's happening in the politics locally? And there'd always be some kind of scandal going on. And I used to open Lyndon with talking about, you know, uh, Jim Bob uh, Bellybog, uh, you know, he's really kind of out in trouble out there, isn't he? You know, and they, they go, what? <laughs> <laughs> but then you got to get back to your own show, you know. I have Lyndon, Teddy, Clarence Darrow and Ernest Hemingway. And with every one of them, except for Lyndon, there was a problem with 
the rights or the this or the that and everyone I had to struggle to get on. And I did the right things. I bought rights. I followed the straight and narrow. But I had some legal problems to solve along the way. You know, people are very chary of rights, and particularly the estate for people who are no longer alive. However, with Teddy, the very first night off Broadway at the Abingdon Theater in New York, there was a knock on my dressing room door. A sharp knock, and I, I said, who's that? And they said, Teddy Roosevelt. I thought, what? And I opened the door, and there was Teddy Roosevelt in front of me, a short man, kind of wide, with a twinkle in his eye and a mustache. And I thought, oh, my God. And he said, I'm Theodore Roosevelt IV. I came to see the show. I was one day in New York. I live in Boston. And I said, uh, did you like it? He said, yes, 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 it's fine, it's fine. It was very, very good, very fine. <laughs> lawyer talk, you know. And then he said, but there is one problem. And I said, what is that, sir? He said, you don't talk enough about his impact on the environment. And I said, okay, what do you mean? And he told me a story, which I had not read anywhere, about how he and the Secretary of the Interior at that time, Gifford Pinchot, had been cut out of being allowed by the legislature, all the Western senators and representatives had joined together to stop him from making any more national parks or any kind of a park. And this was when he was a lame duck. And he said to Pincho, he said, how many days do I have before I have to sign this bill into law? Pincho said, nine days. In nine days, they together created 51 new sanctuaries and parks and preserves. They're good to the American people. And they passed them through the Congress before he had to sign this bill, which eliminated his ability to do this. So he was a very smart politician and a very tough guy. And he also knew exactly what was good for the American people. That's one of the things I really admire about him is that he put parks aside because I like to go hiking, things like that. So to know that he had a hand in that, to preserve all that. And truly, he was a servant of the people, thinking in the interest of the country rather than just himself. That's true. He was there to serve. Not that he didn't uh, angle to get these roles, because he did. Here's the thing about all of the men that I have taken up as my own causes. Every one of them relied on their parents for some kind of guidance when they were young. And they all got it except Hemingway. Hemingway got nothing but hatred from his mother. And therefore, he's Hemingway, if you know what I mean. With all of the difficulties with women, difficulties with everything in his life, he was not loved. His first wife was the person that most resembled the mother that he wished he had. She was also a very smart, beautiful, sexy woman. Hadley, but he abandoned her and their child because he fell in lust with somebody else who had a lot of money. He felt really slimy about that because she was able to support him uh, in his writing, which was not earning any money at the time. That's a gigantic simplification of the Hemingway story. That's not the story that I've told. My favorite play usually is Clarence Darrow because Clarence Darrow took nothing but good things from his father and his mother. They lived in a tiny little town near Youngstown, Ohio. It was a nowhere place. It was in the Western Reserve of Ohio. Their family was a station on the Underground Railroad. In 1857, when Darrow was born, by 1860, when he was three, they were transferring Negro escaped slaves to Canada. I went from the time that Civil War was over, and he was eight. By that time, he had heard the whispering in the other room at night where he was not allowed to go. He and his sisters, uh, he kept hearing the name Harriet Tubman, Sojourner Truth, and all of the other great abolitionist slave savers. And so that was the beginning of his sense of social justice. And as I've grown up and become an actual human being, 
now at 85, I have realized that my entire mission as an actor since the beginning was to try to find some way to allow the theater to work for me as an engine of social justice. I grew up in Arkansas in the Ozarks. My parents were blue-collar workers, you know, on the edge of nowhere, just the kind of essential workers that we now have, not in the same roles, but they were the workers that kept things going, you know. And I saw their struggle. Uh, I always felt the injustice of living in a state, in a place in the world, where Negroes had to bow their heads when a white man walked by or spoke to them. That always, from my earliest memories, seemed so horrendously wrong. How could this be? And also, my parents were Roman Catholic. I was a Roman Catholic. With all the negatives about the church that we can find today, the one vast positive is that the words of the gospel are drilled into you as a kid. You do think, try to think, like, can I be like Jesus? That's what I'm writing about. I'm writing a whole memoir about (laughs) all these subjects, and I'm trying to make it funny. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm glad you're writing about those, because just to hear you talk about them is fascinating. One more question about Teddy, about the graphic novel itself. Now, I've seen the play. Is there anything that you're adding to the graphic novel story that wasn't in the play? Anything else that you want to touch upon that you weren't able to in the one-man show? No. In fact, I slimmed it down because it is a graphic novel. And I think Eric Tate has done a tremendous job of making this come alive on the page. I wanted to slim it down so that the pictures didn't have to carry so much of the dialogue because it is a wordy play. Teddy spoke and spoke well, and all politicians talk, and a lot of the description of the story, it starts with the speech in Saratoga where he has to talk about the boys that we send over there to die for our country, and that causes him to leave the podium and to defend his own life his own warrior philosophy by describing the incidents that he lived through. We moved out to take a red tiled house at the top of the hill, which turned out to be the Spaniards firing bunker from which they could shoot straight down at us as we climbed the hill toward open ground. I rode back and forth in front of my men who were lying in the deep grass. I wanted them to be able to see me. They were dismounted cavalry. I was the only man on horseback and the Spaniards rained fire down upon us from their modern Mauser rifles. I remember the bullets as they went past sounded like pieces of silk being ripped. My men were armed only with short-range carbides, and we were being killed left and right. It seemed silly to stay where we were, so I moved the Rough Riders up through to the very front of the line through a regular army unit that was pinned down by the Spanish fire. Why won't you charge? We have no orders. Well, I'll give the order. Well, who are you? My name is Theodore. Never mind, sir. Please, just let my men pass through. Thank you. Charge. That's a tricky idea right there. It's a series of thoughts within a play that aren't what the play starts out to be, which is a political speech. And I tried to stay, like you were saying before, about stay on the point. What's the story? Uh, Cut the BW and all the beautiful writing that I did, (laughs) and just stick to Teddy's story. You may ask, what writing did I have to do? It's quite amazing when you're using someone else's words and you're trying to make them work on a stage, you really do have to read between the lines in order to know what such a person was actually thinking what the circumstances were, the ambience was, and all of that. So all of that is my work, and the rest of it's Teddy's. It's the way you put it together and the story you choose to tell out of someone's life. I choose to tell the story out of Teddy's life where he lost his son at the age of 61. I mean, he was 61, not his son. He died young, and he died alone in a little room in Sagamore Hill, and his wife was, I believe, somewhat estranged from him by the occasion of the death of their son. Now, that's speculation on my part, but none of the Roosevelts who I've contacted have quarreled with that one bit. 
There are also many uh, other relatives living in New York who came in. This lady, Nancy Jackson, came backstage and she said, thank you for being so tender about Archibald, who was her grandfather, I think. I was tender toward Archie because Archie was the one that was kind of the last one in line, the one that couldn't outrun everybody else. And the competition within the Roosevelt family was always intense. So I have great tenderness for all of those children that Teddy had and uh, Edith. I do want to urge people, when you've read the graphic novel, those of you who are really into graphic novels, I urge you to read this because the art is beautiful. Go back and watch the one-man play. Do yourself a favor. I will put that in the show notes, a link to that. But please, make some time to check that out. You won't regret it. Thank you so much. I am very proud of this play and very proud that Dead Reckoning chose this. This is not a commercial. I just am quite surprised that because of the incredible taste of these folks, not to give me any credit, but to recognize that it's a, an act of courage to publish anything today and to pick this as a graphic representation of Teddy, I think was a great act of courage by uh, the Naval Institute and Dead Reckoning. I'm just thrilled about this book. And uh, I can't even believe it. It's my first real publication. I've translated other things from German and had them printed, but uh, this is my own thing. Thank you for saying that. Well, I mean it, and I was excited to see it. Moving on to some of your other work, I can't leave without mentioning this, is the connection you have with Star Trek, because a lot of my listeners enjoy Star Trek, and you were in Star Trek V as Cybok, Spock's elder half-brother. What is Star Trek? Tell me. <laughs> it's one of the greatest <laughs> science fiction shows ever. Yeah. And... Don't hit me. Don't hit me. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know what Star Trek meant to people until I got this part. I'll tell you the story in order. I had no idea that it was as powerful and strong as it was. Uh, you may know that my mother-in-law had a hand in keeping it alive when she was the head of uh, Desi Lu. The network, I guess it was CBS at the time, or maybe it was NBC, I forget. But anyway, the network saw the pilot of Star Trek and said, nah, we don't think so. It's too expensive. And it was put on Lucy's desk because she was now running the company after the divorce with Desi, and Desi had moved on, but he had been part of the original okay for this because he had a real nose for what's right and good. Anyway, she said, no, no, let's keep it in the lineup because Desi Lu will front the extra expenses if there are any for the starships and post-production and all that stuff. It got on the air. So for that, I'm thankful to Lucille Ball. When I got the part, it was interesting because in Hollywood, when you go to read for producers at a studio, uh, you drive up to the studio gate and the guard says, stop. <laughs> <laughs> Who the hell are you coming onto our nice movie studio? And you identify yourself and they give you a card and they say, okay, drive over there and park in that lot. And the office where you're going is way over there and you're late. <laughs> so you end up parking and racing over to an office where you, you're supposed to be a cool guy and you walk in all sweaty and hot from having raced yourself to get over there <laughs> anyway I drove up to Paramount and the guard gate said oh hello Mr. Luckenbill it was so nice to see you uh, just leave your car right here and uh, so and so will park it for you and uh, he said you just jump in that golf cart right there and I was like, what? What? And I got in the golf cart, and they took me around to Harv Bennett's office. It was about, I don't know, half a mile away. And I'd get out, and he says, good luck, pal. This was unheard of for me, because as a working actor, I'm always working to get a part, you know. So I walked in through the door, and they all stood up. <laughs> That's also a sign of something. What the hell? Bill Shatner and... Uh, Harv Bennett, another producer, and then in the back corner was the writer, <laughs> the, the actual writer of the script. <laughs> uh, writers in Hollywood never get to talk. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like Mank. <laughs> but anyway, they could not have been more 
forthcoming. And Harv started to tell me the story of the script, which, again, is an amazing thing. Usually you get a piece of paper called sides, which is one scene, and you can't tell what's going on in the script at all. All you get is this one little scene, and you have to study that, and then you have to come in and try to do it on camera for them and do it with some indication of what you understand, <laughs> whether you do or not. So all of that was not an issue this day. And uh, Harv started to describe the thing. And Bill said, uh, Larry, I want you to do the part. <laughs> Harv, Harv stopped. And he said, yes, yes, we want you to do the part. I said, why? <laughs> And Bill said, I was in a hotel somewhere one night on a Sunday, and I turned on the TV, and there you were as Lyndon Johnson. And I said, this is the guy for Cybok. And I said, so Cybok is like Lyndon, in your opinion? He said, no, 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 it wasn't that. It was just uh, the way you acted, the energy and the, the power that you had. I said, okay, good, thank you. And they said, take the script home, read it tonight, and give us a yes tomorrow. Well, I can't tell you. I'm a well-regarded actor, but I'm not a uh, bankable star by any means. But I took the thing home and I had all I could do to wait till the morning to say yes. <laughs> because I recognized a really good part. Star Trek uh, has many fans and many detractors, believe it or not, because... With the internet being what it is, you can say any damn thing you want. Oh, yes. And I think people uh, were somehow rather cruel to Bill Shatner about this movie. It was his directorial debut. He did, I think, a very, very good job of handling this property. He did it under enormous amount of pressure because at Paramount, just at that same moment, Batman was being gotten ready to be released. And so when at the end of the shooting of uh, this Star Trek movie, the post-production stuff had to occur right at the studio and their time to create the special effects of going through the barrier to see God were cut short, so short that uh, even the people that did the effects were just horribly mishandled. And that was because Paramount put the energy into the Batman movie. And, you know, of course, that's a fiscal decision, financial decision. So Bill's movie got a little bit shortchanged because of the uh, special effects. But uh, also people criticize Bill all the time for all kinds of things because he puts himself in line for that. He's a swaggering pirate sometimes, you know, but he's also a very good, very smart guy. So it's interesting because we talked only once about what I would do with the part of Cyborg after that meeting. He called me and he said, let's have lunch. I'll buy you lunch. I said, okay, where? He said, meet me at such and such in Hollywood. I get there and it's an orange Julius. <laughs> it's, a, <laughs> it's one of those smoothie stands. And we're standing up at a table outside. And he says, okay, well, what do you think about this, this, this character? And I said, I think it's Vladimir Lenin. And he looked at me and he said, Shh, don't say that. Don't <laughs> let anybody hear you say that. <laughs> we can't have a commie out there. <laughs> and I said, that's not the point. I said, the point is that this character believes in the ideal of everyone being safe from pain. And as he decides to go to find God and to find the source of all the goodness that he feels for people, because he does take their pain away, he decides the only way to accomplish his mission is to steal a starship. And that leads him into developing an army and of helpers who will continue protecting his theft, he gradually becomes a kind of a dictator. Bill said, ah, oh, I see. Okay. I don't think he cared what I said, but he said, uh, good, that's fine. That's how I did it. I said, there's one problem, though. I don't want to have a gun in my hands. I don't want to have any weapons as Cyborg. 
And he said, well, there's that scene, you know. I said, I know there's a scene with Spock, but, uh, you know, it's not right for Cyborg. This is a man who really is a pacifist. He really is an anti-war man. And no matter what he may be forced to do in the script, I want the audience to realize that it is forced for him, that it's a last ditch for him. I want them to have sympathy for this character who has apparently broken a lot of laws and all of that stuff. He's like a protester in Portland, Oregon. Maybe he's breaking the law where you're not supposed to protest on the concrete, uh, but it's necessary because God lives over there, not here. That's actually a better story than the story that we have. <laughs> Shakari, the source. Heaven. Eden. Call it what you will. The Klingons call it Kuitu. To the Romulans, it's Vortavor. The Andorian word is is unpronounceable. Still, every culture in existence shares this common dream of a place from which creation sprang. For us, that place will soon be reality. The only reality I see is that I'm a prisoner on my own ship. What is this power you have to control the minds of my crew? I don't control minds. I free them. How? By making you face your pain and draw strength from it. Once that's done, fear cannot stop you. This is what an actor does. You find ways to associate yourself and your dreams and your, your ethics to the character that you're playing so that you can be as complex as life is. A lot of times in uh, the television work that I've done, that is kind of not possible because of the time schedule and the way the episodic stories were ground out. And I had my own series back in the day, back in the long ago, and it was called the Delphi Bureau. And it's kind of a cult series with the pilot. I was a spy, but I was a reluctant spy and I did not carry a weapon. And that was important to me because I have five children and four boys, four boys and one girl. And I did not want them to see me playing the villain and killing people. I was fortunate to find these great Americans who could speak for me if I would just put their words into my mouth because it allowed me to deal with ethics. And the greatness of America is that there were men like these to stand across the 20th century and say, no, we do believe in human rights. We do believe in the right way to live. And we want to be an example for good. Each one of those men, in their own way, did that. I mean, we wouldn't have Medicare without Lyndon. We wouldn't have any discussion about the death penalty without Clarence Darrow. Teddy Roosevelt went against the huge corporations on the mergers and brought them to heel the railroads and the banks at that time. The Sherman Antitrust Act was during his period. And he also was the earliest politician that I could find wanted women to have the right to vote. And Hemingway broke the mold for writers and said, you don't have to write like Henry James. You don't have to write with all the lovely words. You just have to write so that people are living the experience that you're writing about. They are there. And that requires that you enter into that experience with the same energy that someone facing a bull in the arena would have, which is total concentration on staying alive. So his teaching of that the process of literature, I think is a great thing. Back to you, Larry, about you. This is the part of the show where I kick back with the creator and ask them fun questions I ask all my guests. One of the first questions I ask is, what do you do for recreation? And I am impressed with your exercise regime. TR said, it's better to wear out than to rust out. Uh, yes. You are staying active, sir. You have a busy schedule. What do you do for your regime? I go out. I'll be going out shortly. I'll walk at least two miles at fast up the hills. And I have a cane now for balance because I had back surgery two years ago that was really severe. The best part about the back surgery, which was very arduous, 
was that I lost 40 pounds. First thing I recommend to everybody is stop eating sugar and bread and cheese if you can manage that. Mm -hmm. I've gained a little bit back, but I lost all that weight and felt so good that I realized that the effort it was was nothing compared to how well I felt. I do the walk, I come back here and I work in the office and I sit for hours and hours, but of course I get up quite often, but I walk around the room. I'm editing this huge manuscript, so I focus. And then I swim. I go in the pool, and I'm lucky to have one in my backyard, but if I didn't, I would be going to the public pools here in Palm Springs, which are Olympic-sized, and they're very, very nice pools. But anyway, uh, I swim. I actually do upper body exercises and uh, leg exercises in the pool for about 45 minutes. If I miss these two exercises, I don't feel good. It's just that I'm 85. I'm heading for 100, as far as I'm concerned, and I pray a lot. (laughs) (laughs) I pray. I do pray. I pray for the country. I pray for my children. I pray for my wife, and I do want to be around for them. I have two new grandchildren, a third coming. They are so delicious that it's unreal. What a great thing to have as a grandchild. I never even gave it a thought in my life. What? I don't know about that. But... (laughs) At this point, you know, you get to be 85, either you've got a philosophy about living and dying, or you don't. And if you don't, you're kind of fearful. And I don't want to be uh, live my life in fear. I've developed my own uh, belief system, and my own attitudes, but they're in conformity with the fact that there is a higher power. And this higher power has to be good, because look at the longing that humans have that we cannot resolve any other way but by thinking that there's some design here, that something has created us for what purpose? Carl Jung told uh, an interviewer from Texas who was pressing him on the unconscious, and Jung took his pipe out of his mouth, and he looked at the man in a kind way, and he said, well, you know, the unconscious is really unconscious. (laughs) (laughs) In other words, stop asking this question. (laughs) So I have these thoughts going on in my head, and and they're just mine, and and you're asking, and I'm telling. I tend to be a happy guy these days, and I have the best wife any man could ever, ever have dreamed of having. My final question, because I want to be respectful of your time and of a higher power that's very close to you. You mentioned the missus. Tying back to Teddy, he said the greatest privilege a man could have is a happy marriage. And how do you, sir, since 1980 with Lucy, how have you managed to have a long and happy marriage? Forgiveness. Mm. You know, things happen in marriages. Things happen in human relationships. And I found that the only thing that you can ditch in life and throw away is anger and fear. And that's a very, very hard thing to do. It's a very hard thing to do, and it requires some kind of help from the universe. We used to go back in New York to Unity, the Unity system of thought, which is new thought, but which was developed in Kansas in the 1880s. It really has uh, great things to say about how we live our lives. One of the things that I hold on to from the Unity thoughts is that Charles Fillmore, who was the organizer of Unity, said, do the things that ought to be done by you. And you think about that phrase, that's a double-edged sword, right? Do the things that ought to be done by you. And that means don't do the things that shouldn't be done by you, which is a great leveler in a marriage because a marriage is a partnership. And if both partners are working the same direction, the same way, it works beautifully. And if both partners have their different ways of thinking about things and are unwilling to compromise or unwilling to even listen to the other person's problems, and they may be severe problems, but you have to do that. And you have to do the things that ought to be done by you. And if you have a partner, that's one of the things that you have to do. You have to listen. I think that's why uh, we have survived 40 years. I know that's why. And 
uh, we are get your feet off the couch is still, <laughs> you know, uh, or or you didn't wash that goddamn glass. <laughs> Those are still there every day, so you have to accommodate. Uh, there's nothing wrong with that. I am pretty secure in my own manhood and myself. I think I'm an okay person, but I'm not giving myself any medals for that. I'm just saying that if you work at it and you practice it, and you know what I mean Mm -hmm. with a Zen practice, with any kind of ethical or religious belief, you must practice it. That means you must think about it every day in some way, and you must make every day some kind of a meditation. I do that. It's taken me 85 years to realize that I was human, and I'm not kidding, because before that I was a striver, I was ambitious, I was, in my earlier days, uh, just a wild womanizer, blah, 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 all that stuff. It hasn't left me because of age. I still have my ego. Uh, I try to tame every day. I go into the cage with my ego in the morning. I take my chair and my whip, (laughs) and I try to beat the hell out of it so it will leave me alone today. And part of it's acceptance, too. Accept what comes. And make the best of it. Lawrence Lockenbill, actor, playwright, now the author of a graphic novel, Teddy. Larry, thank you so much for being on Creator Talks. Hooray, Christopher. Thank you. This was really easy and really good. You're good at your job. Thank you so much, Larry. I really appreciated having him on the show. He was such a great storyteller. You didn't hear me say a whole lot because I was listening to his stories, and I just got so wrapped up in them that I forgot (laughs) that I was conducting an interview You have to see his one-man plays for yourself, and you can. His website has been updated, and not only can you get Teddy, the graphic novel, through his website, but you can also see his one-man plays. The original Teddy play is on there, the one in which he portrays President Lyndon Baines Johnson, and also Ernest Hemingway is on there. So I urge you, really, spend some time, put it aside, and watch his one-man plays. I watched those before I spoke to him, which made me really appreciate having a chance to speak to this great actor, who I think is very much underappreciated and underrecognized. I am glad that William Shatner saw him so he could appear in Star Trek V as Cybok. So the website to see his plays and get the graphic novel Teddy is lawrenceluckinbill.com. That's lawrenceluckinbill.com, and the site has just been updated, so please do yourself a favor, check it out. And so what's coming up? Well, I have some guests returning to the show who have not been here in quite a while. And I also have some new guests coming up on the show. One's already recorded. I've met this person in person and haven't had a chance to have them on the show. So they'll be here. And also some guests in the works that I will share more with you about in the weeks ahead. Meanwhile, if you wish to contact me, the best way is through email. Send your emails to creatortalks at gmail.com that's creatortalks at gmail.com and to follow me on social media facebook instagram or twitter you can follow me at creatortalkspod that's at creatortalkspod i am still posting occasionally my silver age and bronze age comics from my personal collection well that's all for now so all of you please take care of yourselves for creator talks this has been your host Christopher Calloway. Until next time.